browser is central to everything we do these days, right? I think Forrester had some analysis where they said that um, 75% of the user's on-device time is, is spent in the browser, right? We've seen a lot of applications move from, um, you know, having fat clients that you would install on your desktop to uh, just being web applications. And similarly on the server side, right? We've seen a lot of applications just move to be web applications. So now attackers recognize this too, right? They know that you're spending all your time in the browser. So if they want to compromise your device, this is, this is what they will target. Hi, this is Yosukun Bhartia and welcome to TFR Let's Talk. Today we have with us Lionel Litty, Chief Security Architect at Menlo Security. Lionel, it's great to have you on the show. Hi, Swap. Yeah, it's uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and today we are going to talk about securing open source and proprietary browsers for enterprise users. Before we get into the weeds of today's discussion, let's quickly talk about Menlo Security. Talk a bit about yourself. What do you folks do? Because security is a big space. Are you focusing on a specific area or browser security? Uh, yeah, we're we're focusing on on browser security. So I guess we're uh, yeah no longer a startup, right? At this point, we have about like five hundred employees. We're based out of um, California in, in in Mountain View, so a little bit south of San Francisco, and we have you know, close to a thousand customers, uh, mostly large enterprises, financial government. Um, and what they turn to us for is securing, securing the browser, right, in, in, in general. So this is what uh, we've been doing for now, um, just over 10 years. What is the role or importance of browser in today's, you know, modern cloud-centric, cloud-driven world that we are talking about browser security? The browser is central to everything we do these days, right? I think Forrester had some analysis where they said that 75% um, of the user's on-device time is, is spent in the browser, right? We've seen a lot of applications move from, um, you know, having fat clients that you would install on your desktop to uh, just being web applications. And similarly on the server side, right? We've seen a lot of applications just move to be web applications. So now, Attackers recognize this too, right? They know that you're spending all your time in the browser. So if they want to compromise your device, this is this is what they will target. And when you say you, do you mean end users? Or are you talking about developers and you know all those personas? Yeah, all of the above, I guess. So they're targeting um, each one and everyone, right? Both end users through phishing attacks and just ransomware, right? As well as developers. And we've seen attacks that are specifically targeted at developers trying to trick you into divulging source code or getting your GitHub credentials, um, as well as just supply supply chain attacks, you know, all of the above. So um, it's, like I said, everyone is using the browser all the time. So this is, it's, uh, everyone's a target. What kind of threats that are you're seeing, which are related to browser targeting these kind of personas, engineering teams? We see first just, a lot of attacks targeting the browser itself, right? Um, you frequently hear about zero days that were targeting browsers, especially when you're talking about developers that tend to be maybe more sophisticated users, right? They may not as easily fall for um, simple phishing attacks, right? Then attackers will turn to um, more sophisticated attacks and, and using browser zero days where um, you're maybe using, well, in the case of zero, zero day, it wouldn't even be that you're using a out of date browser, which is be like, this is an attack we haven't seen before. Um, you just get tricked into visiting a website you shouldn't be visiting. And, you know, these days developers, you also spend all your time searching for how do I use this API? How do I, um, I guess work with this technology I haven't used before. And you may end up visiting sites that are specifically designed to trick you. And then you just visit the sites and it's delivering some payload that targets your browser. And if you're unlucky, you, you might at this point be compromised. You folks also talk about heat or highly evasive and adoptive threats. What are those and how easy and hard it's for an organization to defend against those? Heat is you know, acute acronym, but really these days, all, all attacks are highly evasive and adaptive, right? And um, so 
what we mean by that is just the attacker is not is trying to evade some of the defenses you might have in place, right? Uh, so, for example, um, you might have a secure web gateway that is scanning the content as it comes in and also has some URL reputation filtering, right? So it has a list of sites that are known to be um, bad sites. And attackers will work around both of these things, right? They will work around the URL reputation just by making sure that they lounder reputation, right? Which means either they first created the site and for a little while it was hosting some legitimate content or uh, maybe they compromised a legitimate site and now they're serving malicious content from that compromised site. And then for you know trying to scan what is coming in on the wire, you will see techniques such as HTML smuggling where what happens is the page is encoding the content, like the malicious content, so that if you're trying to just do some signature detection, you will not find it. And then once the user, the user's browser opens the content, right, like the HTML page, then JavaScript on the page will decode the content, and then either you have a you know malicious payload or maybe uh, you know m a ransomware that gets loaded on the user's endpoint, and your secure like your networking security device just is blind to to all of this now let's talk about what how is menlo security helping organizations mitigate some of these threats we see you know browser security as having three pillars um, one of them is managing the browser um, the second one is protecting the user and then the third one is securing your data um, and your access, right? And we help in all three of these dimensions. So for managing the browser, uh, we help you look at how your um, endpoint browsers are currently configured. Um, not everyone knows this, but there's actually hundreds of settings that you can modify for um, Chrome, Edge, Firefox around the behavior of the browser, right? Things like, is it okay to still use TLS 1.1, right? Like an old version of TLS because maybe you have compatibility needs, but most people don't, right? Is it okay to use the webcam? Is it, there's just hundreds of settings, right? And depending on your enterprise needs, you may or may not want to allow some of these uh, to be turned on. And there's actually compliance requirements around this and best practices that have been um, published by places like the Center for Internet Security. So we help you you can upload your browser configuration, we look at it, and then we give you some recommendations around things you might want to change. Uh, and we provide you even with the, uh, you know, a, a updated policy and integration with something like Microsoft Intune that will help you push this updated policy to your endpoints. So that's kind of managing the, um, the trying to help you manage the browser. Uh, so pr for protecting the user, uh, this is where, We've been working on isolation technology for you know, more than 10 years. And um, the idea here is that we provide you with a cloud browser. And when you browse the internet, rather than visiting a site directly, you're redirected to our cloud browser. The cloud browser is the one visiting the site and executing the potentially malicious content. All the active content is uh, run in the cloud browser. And this allows us to both protect you from exploits as well have as have good visibility into what's happening, right? So the earlier example of HTML smuggling where maybe you have an encrypted payload, well, now this is getting decoded in the cloud browser and then we can actually look at any file that uh, you're downloading. And then finally, securing access and securing data. Um, this is where we can do things like data redaction. Like we look at, maybe you need to have your users access a customer management application. And this is maybe an older application, doesn't have fine-grained um, security controls, and it, dis it displays sec social security numbers for your customers maybe, right? Because you have to gather these, but you don't need to show them to your, um, uh, to some of your employees. And so we provide you with the ability to redact some of this content and importantly, before it touches the endpoint, again, because we have this um, cloud browser, right? We can do this redaction in the cloud away from a potentially, you know, compromised endpoint on which you could have 
rootkit or malware, right? That is trying to steal this information. And when it comes to cloud browser, how does it impact the the whole workflow for organizations? And if there are certain dependencies on a specific browser, it could be open source browser or it could be a, a proprietary browser. The idea is that this is really transparent, right? We've always believed that people are not interested in installing another browser, right? And also that they, people have personal preferences, right? Now, maybe you like using Firefox or maybe you're a Chrome user or Microsoft Edge user, right? Uh, and we don't, we don't get in the way of this, right? The way you uh, use our product is you can uh, configure either a proxy or use a, a Chrome extension or you know, Firefox extension um, to be able to redirect your traffic to go through our platform. And then beyond this is it's transparent, right? As a as a user, you don't you don't know it's uh, you don't know it's there. And what kind of uh, concern or worries users may have? I, I'm talking about you know highly sophisticated industries that their traffic is flowing through your browser. That's a good question, right? So at this point, uh, you're you're sending the traffic through our cloud, right? But we are only um, I, I guess we don't persist anything, right? It's kind of like using a VPN, right? Your uh, your traffic is flowing through us. We do a lot of work to secure our platform. I mean, part of our value proposition, right, is that we will maintain this web browser that we have in the cloud, you know, this cloud browser very aggressively, right? So um, it's not, bit, not a big secret, right? It's, it's based off of Chromium. Um, like almost everyone in the industry, right? And this is where, yes, we, we leverage open source, right? Uh, fortunately uh, for us and, 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 and many uh, others, right? Chrome is mostly open source. Uh, and then uh, we maintain it very aggressively, right? So whenever there's like any kind of security update, we uh, push this to a cloud immediately. And I don't know if you like many users, I don't know if you're a Chrome user, but we see many users where, you know, the little icon in the upper right corner telling you that your browser is up to date and you should be relaunching it so that you get the security updates, but it's never a convenient time, right? Uh, so we kind of solve this uh, for you. you. You should still restart your browser and make sure it's up to date. If I'm not wrong, last week, you folks made some announcement. Talk a bit about that announcement and how does that announcement fit into this discussion we just had? Right. Uh, yeah, so last week we announced that we were strengthening our offering around uh, browser security. So I mentioned these three pillars, right? And for a long time, we have been really focused on protecting the end user. Um, so last week, we announced some uh, new capabilities around uh, managing the browser, right? So this is a brand new feature, as well as around protecting um, the, the data, right? So um, the data reduction feature that I mentioned, as well as some other features around what we call last mile DLP, or not just us, right? The industry in general calls last mile DLP, um, is uh, also watermarking content, uh, trying to control how you can copy paste. Uh, and this is all around trying to protect your enterprise data, right? It's also been in the news um, around uh, Gen AI and people, um, you know, using ChatGPT, developers, right? Like I paste some code in there, try to get uh, some advice from uh, the LLM on how to improve my code. And, you know, that, that might not be okay with enterprise policy, or we may want to make sure that you're guided to the LLM that is approved for use in your enterprise, right? As opposed to maybe, you know, ChatGPT, that, that might not be the one that is offered, or maybe you have a private instance of it. Do you also serve a lot of industries which are heavily regulated where they have to either look at things like hip bother? If you do, how do you work around those compliances? Uh, yes, I, I think regulation is also a driver, right, for our, our customers. We work with financials, we work with governments, we work with healthcare. Um, so um, the providing this gap between your endpoint devices and the websites you're accessing is 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 very valuable, right? And we see some overlap with um, VDI type use cases, right? Virtual desktop infrastructure, where you would previously kind of use something like remote desktop to access in the cloud. This time, full blown operating system, right? To do any of your work. Now that your work has moved to your browser, what we offer 
it's very similar to VDI, but it's focused on the browser, right? So you are accessing this in the cloud browser uh, through your endpoint. We don't, you don't need a dedicated client. We just support any browser, uh, but we provide this air gap uh, between end users and the servers they're accessing. We kind of live in an open source driven world, you know, the technologies we use, uh, even the browser we look at, you know, they are either open source purely or based on open source technologies, but they are still proprietary browsers. Um, and there may be organizations for whatsoever reason, they might be dependent on maybe extension was written 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Can you also talk about draw a comparison between securing a browser which is either open source or based on open source versus securing a proprietary browser? Uh, what is the difference and how to ensure that irrespective of what browser a user is running, the workloads are secured, their development environments are secure? Yeah, we see that a lot of the browsers that are in use now at least have open source in their DNA, right? So in terms of what we see these days, we have uh, a lot of Chrome users and then a lot of Edge users, right? Keep in mind that because we are securing enterprise, we have primarily enterprise users. So we do see uh, quite a bit of um, Edge. Uh, so most of these browsers are primarily open source, right? And then uh, we see Safari and, and sadly, not, not a whole lot of Firefox. Um, but, and Safari is also, sort of open source, right? So you, you, it, it is based on uh, the open source web kits. Um, however, there's quite a bit of modifications that Apple adds to, um, to web kits and they're not as open uh, with their development process as Chrome, right? So for us, where this is a challenge is when there's a vulnerability in Safari versus when there's a vulnerability in, in Chrome. Uh, when there's a vulnerability in Safari, you get very little little detail. It ends up being, oh, there was a memory corruption issue that usually the security bulletin is one sentence, right? When, wh which makes it hard, hard for us, right? Because we're trying to establish whether or not our technology is going to protect the end user. Uh, and when we get uh, a bulletin from Chrome, then you can know exactly what the code is, you can go take a look, figure out what uh, was the nature of the vulnerability, what are the various avenues that could be used to exploit it, and then we can provide stronger guarantees around, yes, for sure, this is something we protect, right? Our approach is by design, we protect against, you know, almost all vulnerabilities, but and, and until you've seen all of the details, you cannot, it's hard to be 100%, right? So this is where, for us, it's a lot easier to secure um, open source browsers, although no, we still believe we do a good job securing semi-closed source browsers such as uh, Safari. And yes, fortunately, IE has largely disappeared from uh, from the scene. Lionel, thank you so much for taking time out today to uh, talk about browsers' role in modern world and also the importance of securing it, protecting it, and how Menno Security is doing that job. Thanks for all those great insights. And I would love to chat with you folks again, and not only whenever some new announcement comes up, but whenever we would love, um, whenever there is something to discuss about securing our world. Thank you so much. For sure, it was my pleasure. This is this was great, and yeah, there is a lot to cover. So can talk about this for hours.